Um, our second speaker is Rochelle Copeland from the Bollinger Krebs Group at Penn State. Uh, Rochelle got her Bachelor of Arts degree um, from uh, Wesleyan University in, uh, with, with honors in chemistry. And um, she then, uh, that was 2009, and she took five years to teach high school science, uh, including, uh, most importantly, chemistry in, in H the Houston area. And then she came to Penn State uh, for her PhD. And um, she's worked uh, solo in our group on um, this really wild enzyme that she'll tell you about. And um, I have to say that I think Rochelle's done some of the, the hardest experiments that the Bollinger Krebs lab has ever done to look into a mechanism. And she's broken it wide open and she's really been um, the primary, if not the sole intellectual driving force for this project. So uh, I'll turn it over to Rochelle and let her tell you her story. So the title of my talk is a beta scission cascade for production of ethylene from two oxyglutarates by microbial ethylene forming enzyme. So ethylene is most commonly known as the fruit ripening hormone. But it's also important in industry where it's actually the most abundantly produced compound. Um, it's a feedstock for production of a variety of polymers and solvents that are ubiquitous in our modern lives. So in nature, ethylene, um, there are four pathways by which, by which ethylene is synthesized. And the one that I'm gonna be talking about today is the one shown at the top, wherein ethylene is made from two oxyglutarates um, we would recognize this as being the TCA cycle intermediate. So EFE is actually um, garnering a lot of research attention right now for its potential to support a renewable process for forming ethylene for industrial pur purposes. Um, in other words, to replacing petroleum as the source of ethylene in industry. EFE is an iron and two oxyglutarate dependent oxygenase. And as shown here in its structure, it uses a mononuclear iron cofactor that's ligated by two histidines and one carboxylate residue from the protein, and also is uh, ligated by the TOG, what we call co-substrate. You notice that L-arginine is also bound in the active site. And that is because this enzyme is actually bifunctional. So the majority of the time, it produces ethylene, which does not involve transforming L-arginine, but 30% of the time, it does another reaction wherein it converts 2-OG to succinate and CO2 and uses the oxidizing equivalents from that, um, from that step to affect the two electron oxidation of L-arginine. The observed products of this are guanidine and glutamate semialdehyde, which we detect as P5C. Now this arginine oxidizing reaction, we can imagine to um, involve a hydroxylation at C5 of L-arginine to form a hemiaminal that would break down to give the observed product. And this is very emblematic of the classical iron 2OG enzyme activity. This minor reaction is fundamentally different from the ethylene forming reaction in that instead of just cleaving the C1, C2 bond to form succinate and CO2, the 2OG molecule is broken up at C1, C2, C2, C3, C4, C5 to give you the three equivalents of uh, CO2 and the ethylene unit. So this is a four electron um, oxidation of 2OG. So the um, the focus of my project has been to figure out the mechanism by which EFE is able to carry out this unique reaction. So because this enzyme is able to do um, these two different reactions, a good place to start thinking about it mechanistically is with the classical mechanism, which I'll just walk you through for those who are less familiar. So as I showed previously, we have an iron center with 2OG coordinated to it and the prime substrate or the unique substrate of, of the enzyme, which in this case is L-arginine, bound nearby. The open coordination site allows for oxygen to bind, forming an iron-3 superoxyl species, which then is able to attack C2 of 2OG, leading to decarboxylation at C1 and formation of an iron-2 peroxy succinate intermediate. 
OO cleavage at this point forms succinate in addition to this um, iron four oxo species. This high valence iron is able to um, initiate oxidation of the prime substrate by hydrogen atom abstraction. The result of that is formation of a substrate radical, which can then couple with the hydroxyl ligand to form the hydroxylated product and also return the cofactor to the iron two state. Now, the intermediate in this step, in this process that we've been able to characterize and we, for which we have a number of tools to investigate is the iron four oxo. And the way we typically probe uh, activity or reactivity around the, the iron four oxo is by introducing deuterium at the, what we believe to be the site on the molecule that is targeted for hydrogen atom abstraction and then use UV vis and MOS bar spectroscopy to observe changes in the ferro. So a uh, reasonable uh, hypothesis from which to launch investigation into uh, the mechanism of ethylene formation is that what if this ferro, instead of targeting arginine for oxidation, is instead able to target the succinate that's bound to it. So, uh, the way we thought about this, we'd be looking for two things. We'd be looking for one, a, a kinetic isotope effect on hydrogen atom abstraction from arginine. And we'd be looking to see whether that KIE changes the partition, partitioning between the two pathways such that ethylene becomes uh, even more so the dominant product. So I'll walk you through the results, maybe. Okay, I'll walk you through the results um, of our investigation into this question. So we use salt flow and freeze quench in methods in tandem with UV vis and MOS bar spectroscopy. Um, so it's basically a rapid mixing technique wherein in one syringe you have the enzyme, iron, 2OG, and arginine, and it's all anoxic. And we mix that with oxygenated buffer and observe the changes in the, in the ferrule. So as shown here in this um, UV trace, with L-arginine, which is unlabeled, we accumulate a small amount of ferrule. However, when we have deuterium on the arginine substrate, we accumulate more ferrule. And that's because we have a kinetic isotope effect on ferrule decay via hydrogen atom abstraction. And we can verify that the signal that we're seeing in the UV spectrum is in fact due to an iron four species by looking at the MOS bar spectrum. So as shown up top here, this pair of lines called the quadrupole doublet has parameters consistent with an iron two state. After reacting with oxygen for a period of time, we see a new feature develop, which is clearer in the different spectrum as the um, high energy line of a different quadrupole doublet that has parameters consistent with an iron four oxo. So we have evidence that there is a kinetic isotope effect that it is on a ferro. However, what we really need to know is whether or not this uh, changes the product distribution. And these are the results that I'm showing here. So as I mentioned, ethylene is a dominant product by a factor of around two and a half to one. So that's the blue compared to the orange bar here, ethylene to succinate. But importantly, regardless of uh, whether we have unlabeled or labeled arginine, that ratio of succinate to ethylene does not change. And what that tells us, therefore, is that the feral intermediate is not the branch point for these two pathways. And furthermore, it tells us that the bifurcation point um, precedes feral formation. So it's an intermediate that is upstream of the feral that is the branch point. So, of the other intermediates that I've uh, described earlier, one that has been experimentally observed is this iron two per succinate state. And um, the Bull lab was able to observe this in crystals of another iron two OG enzyme. So shifting focus to this intermediate, we hypothesize that what could be happening is that instead of um, undergoing OO cleavage to form a ferrule and thereby enabling arginine oxidation, this persuxinate intermediate could undergo a multibond fragmentation 
which gives rise to ethylene and the CO2 products. However, we don't have a spectroscopic handle for this intermediate. As I've shown previously, all we were able to observe was the ferrule that was already committed at that point to arginine oxidation. So we kind of shifted our focus from the question of when do the pathways bifurcate to how is whatever in the, the actual intermediate is, um, how is it fragmented in order to give rise to ethylene? And for this question, we can consider two classes of mechanisms. One in which all the bonds are fragmented simultaneously with the formation of the double bond that um, forms ethylene. And this would be a heterolytic process or a stepwise process that would be radical mediated. So this is the question that I'm gonna be focusing on for the rest of the talk. And that is, is this a concerted fragmentation or is it stepwise? Now for this type of fragmentation, For this type of fragmentation, um, we can kind of think back to our basic organic chemistry concept where we have a group um, C5 that needs to be anti-paraplanar to the other, the, the, group, the other group that leaves, which is that C2. And that requirement for anti-paraplanarity means that this reaction is, if it's concerted, it's going to be stereospecific. So whatever stereochemistry we have in the 2OG starting product, is going to be starting material is going to be reflected in the ethylene product. How did we introduce stereochemistry into 2OG? We did so by synthesizing stereospecifically deuterated 2OG. So in the figures I'm going to show, the orange represents deuterium, the black represents protium. So I'll illustrate that in more detail here. So we have 2OG, it forms an intermediate, which we initially speculated could be this um, iron 2 peroxy succinate. If it's a concerted process, um, the protein, the deuterium on one uh, methylene unit is going to be on the same side of the molecule as the protein on the other. And being concerted, retaining stereochemistry would allow us to form trans D2 ethylene starting from 3S4R2OG. In contrast, if we had a radical mediated process initiated perhaps by OO homolysis, leading to formation of a substantial radical, that radical could undergo beta scission to give you a propionate ill radical. Once you've broken that bond, it is now possible for rotation to occur between the C three and C4 units or between the methylene fragments. And that rotation would scramble stereochemistry leading to a formation of both cis and trans ethylene. Um, and there are two ways we envision this uh, propionate radical forming the final products. One could be by transferring uh, the electron to the ion center to form a carbocation, which would then fragment or another beta scission event which would form a formant radical from C5, which would then quench on the iron. But the, the point here is that a concerted mechanism would give you a specific stereoisomer. And based on the substrate that we've made, it would be the trans isomer of ethylene, whereas a radical mechanism would give you both cis and trans. And cis and trans ethylene can be distinguished using um, IR spectroscopy. So cis has a major peak at 842 wave numbers whereas trans has peaks at 988 and 727. And since we were anticipating the possibility of a mixture, we also looked at um, changes in the spectra as you go from predominantly cis to predominantly trans. As expected, we see a decrease in intensity at 842 and an increase in intensity at 988 and 727 as we go from completely cis to completely trans. So what did the results from EFE actually look like? So in the spectrum that we obtained, we see peaks at 988, 842, 727, showing clearly that there are both cis and trans. We also see another peak attributable to CO2, and then a small amount, these two little humps here, um, corresponding to D1. So a little bit of washout um, from the 2OG, the D2 2OG substrate. And when we overlay our, our reaction spectrum with our standard spectrum, we see that um, the intensity of the ethylene peaks matches pretty well with the 50-50 mixture. 
So what this tells us is that starting with 3S4R2OG, we end up with a one-to-one -one mixture of cis and transethylene, which is strong evidence for a radical, not a concerted mechanism. Now, to be completely sure of this result and to verify that we do have the, the stereoisomer of 2OG that we hope for, we could actually look at the other pathway. Because as I mentioned earlier, um, the arginine oxidizing pathway that forms succinate does not involve any bond changes beyond C2 of the 2OG substrate, meaning that that process is stereospecific. So starting off with SR2OG should yield us SR or mesosubstinate. To verify this, I use the enzyme isocitrate lyase. Isocitrate lyase will combine succinate with glyoxalate to form, I'm realizing all this time that you guys have not been seeing a laser, um, to form isocitrate. And it does this by exchanging only the pro-S hydrogens on succinate. So the predictions that this allows us to make are that if we had deuteria at the pro-R positions, they wouldn't be exchanged. So we would end up with still D2 after incubation with isocitrate lyase. If we had SS diduro succinate, both deuteria would be washed out to solvent. So we would end up with none. And then if we had uh, RS, only the S, the one of the pro S position would be exchanged, leading to observation of D1 succinate. And that is, in fact, what we observe. We see that we start off our, with our ethylene products having being D2, which represented in orange here. And after incubation with isocitrate lice, we end up with a quantitative amount of D1. So we do have the correct substrate. And together, these results um, really indicate that we have a radical mechanism of ethylene formation. Now, as I mentioned, we don't know exactly what the branch point intermediate is, but what we can um, surmise from these results is the intermediacy of a propionate 3 ill radical. So uh, one idea we had was to try to see if we could get other evidence corroborating the intermediacy of this radical by looking for alternative products of its breakdown. Now, the, the native reaction is pretty well coupled. We only see the products that I have depicted here. However, we decided to look at, um, so we therefore decided to look at uh, 2OG analogs, one of which is 2-oxoadipate. 2-oxoadipate is just like 2OG, except it has an additional methylene unit, which means that if it were to proceed via the same mechanism, we would form a butyrate radical. And that butyrate radical would not be able to undergo another beta scission event in the way that the propionate ill radical would. And so we might be more a better able to observe alternative products. So I'll show you the um, chromatogram results here. Um, without EFE present, we see just the substrate 2OA. With as uh, EFE present, we see consumption of the substrate and production of a product, which based on its mass and its retention time, we assign as glutarate. So we're seeing essentially the analogous reaction of 2OG going to succinate and 2OA going to glutarate. It's just one uh, methylene unit longer. When we include arginine in the EFE reaction, we see yet another product which based on its mass and retention time, we assign as being 4-hydroxybutyrate. And to verify the regio uh, chemistry of this product, we also compared it to standards of 3 and 2-hydroxy. And we can see clearly that our EFE product um, is the 4-hydroxybutyrate. So we think that the observed product can be rationalized by the formation of a butyrate radical and the quenching of that radical on an oxygen in the active site. It should also be um, noted that despite the substrate being a little bit longer, um, it actually is a well-coupled system. So the formation of glutarate, glutarate sorry, 
is um, stoichiometric with the oxidation of arginine. So we do see evidence for a butyrate radical, which suggests that in the native reaction, we do have a propionate radical as our stereochemistry result implied. And so um, I'll just wrap up by uh, bringing back into focus, we started off with thinking about the when of how the pathways bifurcate. However, we kind of shifted focus after establishing that it's not a ferrule, the ferrule is not the branch point. to the question of how does whatever the actual intermediate is fragment and our results together show that it is a stepwise process. Um, currently, we are working on seeing whether other 2OG derivatives can make uh, hydroxypropionate derivatives. We are looking into the source of oxygen into, in the observed product. And by answering these questions, we are getting pretty close um, to identifying what the actual branch point intermediate is. And with that, I want to thank the Bollinger Grips group. It's a great place to work. Um, thanks, Marty and Carson, for giving me a lot of freedom to explore this project. Um, the people who are highlighted in blue worked, uh, with EF, worked with me on EFE. Irene helped a lot with molecular biology and protein purification. Beth helped with spectroscopy. Kent with assays and protein purification. And Shengben made the butyrated 2OG substrate. Um, thanks also to Professor Amy Bull and her former postdoc, Kathleen Davis, who's now a PI at Emory, um, for the crystallography work, and uh, Professor Todd Sowers and TJ Zimudzi for their assistance with GC and with IR. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, um, Anthony, did any come in in the uh, Q&A? Okay, so I think uh, Chris Pryor, you uh, your hands up. So do you want to you want to speak live, Chris? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it's good, Chris. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Rochelle, for a great talk. That was really interesting. Um, so I had a couple questions. Um, the first was I was wondering, like, to what extent? you think this ethylene forming pathway might be happening in other alpha ketoglutarate dependent enzymes? Is this a, a low level uncoupling pathway common in, in, in this entire family? And then I was also wondering about, you know, that partitioning between the ethylene forming and the arginine hydroxylation. Do you know what, um, if there's something that is slowing down H atom abstraction from arginine and, and how that pathway is controlled? Okay, um, to answer your first question, it has not been, uh, ethylene information has not been observed, but it is definitely something that we are interested in looking into whether it is possible that the other iron 2 d enzymes can make a small amount of ethylene. Um, regarding the second question, um, so our first set of results established that the ferrule is not the branch point. So um, there isn't a competition between hydrogen atom abstraction and ethylene formation. The competition happens at an earlier step. Okay, good. Thank you. Rochelle, may maybe I could go if that's okay. So first of all, great talk. And yes, yeah, so the, the experiments were very, very challenging. Uh, but so now you've got a, a, you know, sort of a better grasp of the mechanism, a good mechanism of understanding. Do you, do you envision any sub like protein substitutions that you could make to deliberately perturb or rationally perturb the sort of partition in between the two pathways? Yeah, actually. Um, we think that factor, the 2OG pocket is important for ensuring the observed outcome. Um, but to continue answering your question, sorry. Um, we do think that, well, I do think that it's possible to make substitutions in the 2OG pocket that might enable formation of, of different products. 